and, and uh, we're going to give you a $50 debit card, take away all your health insurance cards, and uh, uh, there'll be some, some beans in the refrigerator, your, your Walmart pin is waiting for you, and you are to report to work at 8 o'clock tomorrow on the check stand because I want you talking to people, and the Walmart's in a real poor part of town, you know, and find out just some of the problems that people are up against. All right, let's say I want to teach a concept such as up. You teach it with specific example. Walk up the hill, lift the cup up, the plane flies up in the air, put a box up on the shelf, and don't put hurry up in there. You're going to have to save that for, for like the abnormal stuff. But you've got to teach this up concept with a bunch of different specific examples because it's not top-down thinking. This is one of the most important things in, in working with some of these kids. Also, my thinking is associative, it's not linear. It's associative. Okay, so I see the United Airlines terminal in, in uh, Chicago. I can then start Googling in my mind glass structures or airports. There are no generalized pictures. And I was shocked to find out when a long time ago, about 20 years ago, I asked a speech therapist about, you know, very verbal thinker about church steeples, and she goes, oh, pointy thing. And it was very, very vague. And I'm going, wait a minute, there's no vague thing like that in my mind. I only see specific ones. All right, glass structures, biosphere, the Crystal Palace, our greenhouse at Colorado State. Okay, now I'm seeing a luncheon I was at today with our chairman. You see how I had associated that? We had some very nice meat that our, uh, that our meat judging team cooked. It was very delicious. Um, it was wonderful. We had bluebell ice cream. So now I'm seeing this meal that we had. Okay, now you see how that's associated back to the Colorado State University greenhouse that's right next to our animal science building. See, that's associative thinking. That's not just out of the blue. Okay, airport category. Denver, Dallas, Minneapolis, Atlanta. I almost got stuck in that snowstorm mess. And then, of course, you got LaGuardia. And when I asked an astrophysicist about the church steeples, he saw this abstract motion of people swaying and singing and praying. This guy worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, let's look at how some ways how, that thinking in an animal can be very concrete and how categories work. Cattle, may, these cattle have learned that the uh, guy on the horse is safe, but if they've never seen a person on the ground, they'll freak out and run away. You see, this is why it's so important in cattle to train them both for riding and for going in and out of pens on foot. This is not very safe when they go to an auction and they're bouncing off the walls because they're seeing their first man on foot. But you see, you've got to think about it. A man on a horse is a totally different picture than a man on the ground. And if the cowboy leads the horse, then you kind of get halfway in between. You know, they, don't, they freak out just a little bit. You see, because that sort of looks the same. So you've got to think about it in a non-word way. Okay, let's say we're troubleshooting. And I find that troubleshooting is the same, no matter whether it's an industry, whether it's a problem with a kid, like let's say is it, is it biology, like maybe a sensory problem, or is it a behavior problem? Well, I was just talking to a mom about tantrums that her kid's throwing. And, uh, you know, and it, well, first of all, is it happening in the shopping center where it's noisy? No. Well, I can tell you, my mother dealt temp tantrums with me. A temper tantrum was equal to one night with no TV. That was the rule. She put me in my room. I'd pitch a big one. She'd come back in and say, okay, I'm very pleased you've calmed down. There'll be no TV tonight. You know, you don't get into the abstract stuff. It's just a rule. Temper tantrum equals no TV, or today it's going to be no iPad for tonight. <laughs> and it's just an ironclad rule. Now, she did make an exception when I pitched a fit at the circus when the cannons went off, because that was definitely sensory overload. And top-down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. I think this is one of the things that's really wrong in our educational system. You know, what education is just gets into fad after fad after fad. And they think they've got to do these uh, uh, very rigid way of doing school to pass the tests. Well, you could put the math into into all kinds of things. I was just talking to a teacher up at CSU that has an old textbook on how to do geometry with embroidery. I said, you got any good pictures in that? I want to put that in my presentation. You know, because we need to be putting the hands-on things back in. 
If I hadn't had art and sewing when I was in elementary school, I would have just been miserable. Those are the things that made school worthwhile. And getting back to the passions, well, how could a kid learn that he likes a musical instrument if he'd never played one? I think we're getting into some real problems of, you know, kids not getting enough experience. There's a big world out there other than just, you know, what's going on inside your phone. And the other thing, I don't like the New York Times on a phone. I just hate it. And I know it has to be formatted that way because otherwise you can't read it. But the thing I like about the real paper, or at least looking at it on a computer, is I like looking at where I can see a bunch of headlines. Now, maybe I'm not interested in a lot of those things, but at least I've read the headlines. You know, the problem is with electronic media today, I think it's going to make things worse on people getting in their silos and not getting out of their silos. All right, what's dog fooding? That's a term that programmers use. Okay, they wrote some code for some phones, and then they got to use that, that phone. That's an example of dog fooding. You got to use the thing that you did. Now, policymakers need to get a lot more involved in having to use the stuff that they make. All right, there are the lucky ones. Boy, I bet you there's a lot of Asperger's there. <laughs> and they, um, the, the uh, guy with the gray hair there, he was originally a theater major, of all things, and then switched over to physics. But this is the thing that makes me crazy. I went and I visited um, JPL, very interesting. I got to sit in, in the rocket scientist chair in the control room. That's about as close as I'm going to get to rocket science, is to sit in the chair and fantasize about it. And, but I know there's people on the spectrum there. See, and this is what makes me crazy. When I go outside the autism silo, I'm seeing, like, I've been to the Googleplex, I've been to Pixar, I've been to Disney Imagineering, I've been up to Microsoft. You've got all kinds of people there that I know are on the spectrum. There was one kid about 25 years old at one of the places, and he, he admitted to having face blindness. He says, well, is that autism? I go, yeah, it's a very big part of autism. Now, I was more interested in looking at things than looking at people. But we need to have people in the world interested in things. Because I think a mind can either be made more social or a mind can be made more cognitive. You know, get back to a switch that, you know, you're moving that switch back and forth. We gotta stretch these kids. I also had a great science teacher. You know, for the first two years when I was in a special boarding school, after getting kicked out of ninth grade for fighting when I got teased, was the first two years I was there, all I did was clean horse stalls and run the horse barn. But I'll tell you what I was learning. I was learning work skills. And this is another big problem area. I'm seeing kids graduating from college, then they can't hold a job because they can't get their butt into work. And even if you're in the best job, there's going to be some stuff in that job that's not really very much fun. But you've got to do that stuff that's not very much fun. And my science teacher got me turned around. OK, I had to study English and history. Now, I was perfectly capable of studying those subjects. You know, but then when I had the goal of becoming a scientist. But I think around age 12, we've got to start finding paper route substitutes. How about walking dogs for the next door neighbors, helping out at the farmer's market? And as soon as they're 14 in this state, because I got my official workplace rule posters my business has to buy, I actually read them. <laughs> And I found out that in the state of Colorado, unlike other states, that 14-year-olds can work in safe occupations like retail stores. And we, you know, got they, maybe the national chains won't hire them, but the local retail stores, students have got to learn work skills, the being on time, the discipline and responsibility of a job. And the other thing we've got to not allow is there's too many kids becoming a recluse in their room. I was allowed to goof off in high school. I didn't do much studying. But the one place where Mr. Patey, the headmaster, drew an absolute line in the sand is I was not allowed to become a recluse. And when I didn't want to go to Friday night movie night, he gave me a choice. I could be the projectionist or I could sit in the audience, but not going was not going to be an option, just that simple. And you know, I'm hearing too much, he's 17, we can't get him out of the basement, you know, too much addiction to video games. And that needs to get limited. And I'm not seeing these kids going on and learning how to program games. You know, there's some great stuff online for learning programming. But I, a psychologist, I just talked to a psychologist like a month ago, and she said, we've got to expand their world. Because of anxiety, there's a tendency for the world to contract. And you've got to not let that happen. But no surprises. 
And when I was 15, I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch. And I had a choice. I could stay for a week and come back, or I could go all summer. And once I got out there, I loved it. You know, I'm seeing, you, you can't do sudden surprises with these kids, but you got to stretch them. The other problem is kids don't do free play anymore. I had a very interesting talk with a lady out in San Francisco that runs a big organic farm, and she has regular kids come out, 10 to 11-year-old regular kids come out to camp out in the walnut orchard, big 10-acre orchard. And they have opportunity just to do free play. They don't know how to do free play. She says they mope around for two days talking about video games because they've taken away all the phones and everything. And then about the end of the two days, something happens and they start doing free play. But it also teaches them how to get along, how to cooperate. And again, I said taking out the hands-on classes is the worst thing we've ever did. We have a huge shortage of skilled trades workers. You know, who's going to fix things like electrical stuff when it breaks? I was just out at a, a great Thorncroft, a really fantastic horse place. But I have to say, I just couldn't take my eyes off their electrical wiring. I couldn't believe what bad shape it was in. And it had been knocked down in one storm, and they just had pinned it up in the, in the uh, you know, like, uh, you know, sort of temporary, and it was like in the trees and everything. Uh, you know, it's a real need, you know, the fixing, the infrastructure. This is the things that just saved me was uh, doing a horseback riding and running the horse barn, carpentry projects. Well, and when I was not studying, boy, I learned work skills. I fixed up our Skeeto house really nice, and I did not decorate it with Star Trek because I don't think that would have been appreciated. <laughs> you know, we need to be, uh, you know, cutting down on the screen time. I... Uh, and doing things of using electronics with kids, make it an interactive activity with an adult. All right, I talked to a mom who figured out how to connect Minecraft to the real world. She went to a lumber yard and had them cut up a whole bunch of two by fours into blocks. And then she got all the kids over and got them to sand the blocks and paint the blocks. So now they had Minecraft blocks for the driveway. I thought that was just great. I was a big hit with the neighborhood kids. Well, I, was, I ran into a guy that, at the airport in France. He's waiting in line to get on the plane, and he's working on an energy project that could really solve energy issues, and they're looking for, like, mathematicians. And he says, well, we're working with the colleges. And I said to him, it's too late. You've got to work with a fourth grader <laughs> before he becomes a behavior problem because he's doing baby math over and over again. Maybe what we need to do is a mathematical Minecraft that uh, the job recruiters are hooked up on the other end of it. You know, let's put the video game stuff to use so that we can, um, make it, it's, a, it's like a laser, laser contained warp drive from Star Trip ship Enterprise. The Fr French are also working on the same kind of project to solve the energy problems. We won't need oil wells if we have this. And it's gonna take some little kid that's Asperger's to figure out the math. And when they figure out the math, they're probably going to be kicking themselves. It'll probably be dirt simple. But the simple things are the hard things to think up. Other great activities of 4-H and FFA. You know, we need to be really supporting these activities. And one um, a group um, called Agribility, they really like pig projects because, you see, to train your pig, you don't have a halter. You know, and if you want your pig to walk nicely and show nicely and not be screeching and running away, you've got to spend a lot of time work, start working with your piglet when it's this long, training your piglet. Well, that also teaches the kid. Ability and art was always encouraged. The other thing is kids get fixated on their favorite things. Okay, let's say it's Minecraft. Well, how about getting interested in programming computers? How about taking a carpentry class or a welding class? You know, let's make a tie-in to it. You know, let's teach math with these things, teach reading with these things, tie into those fixations. All right, here's great online resources, Code Academy, Udacity. You know, there's all kinds of um, really uh, fantastic things online. There's also a children's uh, uh, programming, um, you know, for real young kids. There's fabulous stuff online. There's a lot of garbage on the Internet, but there's also a lot of really good stuff. Well... I really did get interested in optical illusion rooms. And this gets back to showing kids interesting stuff. And there's one of my designs in SketchUp. SketchUp's a free program that you can 
get online. And you can do SketchUp clubs. And then they can print their things out on 3D printers. Very cool. And schools say that they can't afford that. That's about a $2,000 thing. Yeah, but they can afford a very fancy, classy weight room. Yes, that I used the restroom in at a high school. You know, I think around here we're going sports cuckoo. And the thing is, is that some of the kids that are kind of the geeky, nerdy kids aren't interested in sports. Now, I really liked what they said here on their website. Warning, you need to have patience. This is where the computer world ties into the physical world. Because if you get mad at this machine and you don't do it right, it'll just print you a pile of gook rather than printing your thing. You can, you know, print out little things like that. Um, this is a really cool thing. It's a Brock Magiscope. It's a wonderful little kid's microscope. I was so happy when I went to Gifted Conference to see a bunch of eight-year-olds put the phones down so they could look at pond scum and leaves under the Brock Magiscope. We need, and, and it's, it's, it's very simple to use, and it's only cost like $150. Uh, there's all cool math things online. Okay, teaching reading. If the kids actually print, you know, use their hands to write, it helps them to learn better. And I thought this was interesting about story comprehension. They have better comprehension if you use a paper book. Uh, now, I think a Kindle would work just fine because it's plain, but if you use an e-book with a lot of interactive features, then the kid's looking at that link, that bright blue link, wants to click on it. And then he's not paying attention to the story. Now, they didn't test a plain Kindle. That probably would be pretty much the same. You know, you, you know this gets into the whole thing of attention. You need to touch to perceive. I went out to Pixar, and they still do a lot of stuff by hand. You know, and I found that when the meat industry went from uh, hand drawing to the computerized drawing, we started getting strange mistakes on drawings, like they didn't know where the center of the circle was. And I found out that usually a young person had drawn this, they'd never built anything with their hands. They'd never done anything with their hands. They weren't seeing their drawings right. And we need to be getting more, you know, good science teachers. There's a lot of retired people that could teach science in a school. And I don't see why a retired chemist has to take stupid ed courses. I think maybe some coaching on classroom management would be needed. But um, that'd be it. We got to get back to doing real stuff. We need to use visualization on looking at, um, you know, when they talk about things in the national budget. You know, remember back in 2008 they did that bailout? That was equal to two Denver airports for every state. What happened to that money? You see, now when you say it's umpty ump billion dollars, it doesn't really mean that much. But two Denver airports, that would have purchased the land, water, power, control tower, runways, buildings, everything except airplanes and, and cars and vehicles. Car rental lots, cargo warehouses, every, you know, everything that doesn't have tires, except the little train that's included, that has tires. But, <laughs> but everything else that flies or rolls, not included. But the whole entire airport's worth $5 billion. Now I've got to go price out that new Weston they're building. I've got to add that to it. But I like to take these big amounts of money and convert it back to something real that ordinary people can relate to. You know, they'll say things like, oh, a billion dollars is equal to how many dollar bills going to the sun. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. But how many, I like to look at big amounts of money in terms of how many airports I could buy. You know, something that you can relate to. You know, what do employers want today? They want people that know how to work. Well, if you're on the spectrum, or let's say you're just kind of geeky and kind of weird, you've got to sell your work rather than yourself. So I'm a big believer in making portfolios. Also, on every project I worked on, is I always asked for specific goals. The project had to do some specific things. And you can't be vague. I mean, let's say, Let's say a um, person on the spectrum is being kind of rude to coworkers. You can't be vague and say you're not a team player. You've got to say stuff like, well, when you called Jim stupid, that was really rude. You know, you've got to get much more specific. All right, let's say we want to teach a 12-year-old how to be a tour guide to the museum, and they'll take him as young as 12. You have to demonstrate the correct distance, demonstrate shaking hands. I don't know how many kids I have taught to shake hands at the book table. And you gotta just teach them how hard to squeeze, you know, you don't rip it off. No, you don't stick a dead fish out like that. <laughs> um, it's like coaching an actor in a play. 
that's what it's like. All right, sensory issues. Boy, if there's an area that needs to be researched, it's sensory, because all these different disorders can have sensory issues. When I was a little kid, loud sounds hurt my ears. Now, sometimes these things can be better tolerated if the child initiates it. Let's go back to the mic. Okay, so if I take this and I hope this is turned off right now, I like brought it up to the speaker, it's going to start to go, eh! and then I can move back and stop it. Sometimes you can desensitize it in little kids if the kid has some control. You know, and I think this has to be done young because I don't think the adults can be desensitized. Believe you me, they've written, when I've talked about this, they've written to me about this. But I think some of the very young kids, if you give them control, you can be desensitized. Uh, some individuals, uh, hearing cuts in and out like a bad phone. The other thing in talking to the little ones, you gotta slow down and enunciate the hard consonants. Slow down when you talk so they can hear those hard consonant sounds. You know, like cat. If you say it fast, you might just hear ah. Attention shifting slowness. It takes much longer to shift back and forth between two different things. You've got to give the brain time to process. Some kids, when they go to read, the print jiggles on the page. Now, I don't have this problem. See, the thing about sensory issues, they are so variable. One kid has this problem, another kid doesn't. But there's some simple things you can do, like try printing the book on pale pastel paper. Gray, tan, light blue, light lavender, all the different pale pastel colors. Try colored lenses, pale pinks, pale purple lenses. The kid's got to pick out the color that works for him. Some individuals have got to get away from fluorescent lighting because they can see that flickering. Now, fortunately, those lights are going away, thank goodness, and it's good riddance. Another thing that's going away are all the old TV-type computers, and the older-type computer screens are terrible. Tablets, laptops, and phones don't flicker. All right, there's my head. Now, that is all the white matter circuits that connect up different parts of the brain. And this is where you have abnormalities in a developmental disorder. It's in the inter-office communication. Now, there's my connectome without the rest of my head. And you can see the little tiny fibers there. Those are big, long axons that go all the way across the brain. Now, another thing, problem I have in the gun to puberty is I start having horrible, horrible anxiety attacks. And I'm now taking antidepressant medication. There's way too much medication given out to little kids like candy. But there are some individuals, especially when they hit puberty, where they're in constant panic attacks. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, which is for sale out there, I have a chapter in there called The Believer in Biochemistry, where I describe my experiences with panic attacks. And I was helped greatly with a very, very low dose of antidepressant medication. And I'm still on that medication. I don't dare stop taking it. I've seen too many disasters when, when, uh, when someone stable goes off their meds, so I don't want to be that experiment. Well, and then at the workplace, um, maybe some people have got to get away from fluorescent lights. You know, if you want me to do some serious writing, I've got to have a quiet place to work. Some individuals may need to have some breaks to calm down. Also, no sudden surprises. You know, it would not be a good idea to come into the office one day and the whole office was torn up with construction. If that's going to be done, let's know about it a week or so before it happens. And I still can't stand scratchy clothes. Now, if I still I got problems with that, then I find some cotton itches and other cotton doesn't. Well, how did I deal with my aggression problem? Well, I switched from anger to crying. It's okay for geeks to cry. Why don't you look up the 60 minutes where the NASA space scientists are crying when the shuttle got, you know, closed down. Well, that's better than throwing things. <laughs> well, it takes a village to raise a kid. And I, I'm really getting concerned about too much locked into labels. You know, how much top-down thinking there really is. Okay, once the kid gets past age three, where it's early intervention, I can pretty much say the same thing. I've got to know much more specifically what his problem is. I don't care what his problem is, autism. All right, what is his problem? Okay, seven years old, we got some kind of problem. Well, first of all, I got to, can he talk? Is he capable of doing normal schoolwork? Um, what's he good at? What's he bad at? What kind of behavior, is he being teased? Why has he got a behavior problem? Is it sensory? You know, I've got to really, has he got a sensory issue? 
See, I think autism is going to need to get chopped up into its component parts. I think the social awkwardness and the problems with uh, face recognition and eye, not understanding eye signals, that's the core criteria. Then you've got other things like uh, the sensory problems, uh, uh, problems with not being able to remember long strings of verbal information. I've got problems with that. Uh, attention shifting issues. You've got to figure out exactly what the problem is. And there's way too many medicines just given out, thrown out like candy without very much thought being put into it. Well, okay, well, I think we'll end it there and want to thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming and a special thanks to Temple Grandin. And I think she might be signing one or two books out there if you'd like. So thanks for being here tonight. <laughs>